Welcome to chapter 5. Chapter 5 is the skin. And the skin is a really, really important organ of the body for the primary reason that it protects us. It is there on our outer surface trying to keep things from coming into our body that shouldn't come into our body and then trying to keep things in our body that don't need to come out. So it's really important stuff. And as long as your skin is intact, you avoid a lot of pathogens that you're actually exposed to. So here's a generic diagram of skin, and we can see that it has three different layers. The epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. And you're reading about that in your reading assignment, but uh, you can see here that there is a fair bit of stuff going on within the layers of the skin. If we look at a microscopic view of what we just saw there, we see the epidermis and then the dermis. And what we want to focus on here is the papillary layer. So that's the layer of the dermis right up underneath the epidermis. And it's like finger-like projections stabbing up into those lower layers of the epidermis. And a key feature of the epidermis is that the outermost layers are dead cells and only the bottom couple layers are living cells. And in this image, the dead stuff is the orange and then the living layer of the epidermis is the blue, the darker blue. And then the light blue fingers poking up into the darker blue is the papillary layer of the dermis. The significance here is that, A, if you're covered with dead stuff on the outside, and you damage dead stuff, whether it's by abrasion, by physical contact, by chemical exposure, as long as it's only contacting those layers of dead cells, so what? It's already dead. It can't really be harmed. So being covered with dead stuff is a wonderful protection for the body. And the reason why that you have the living epidermis at the bottom and the dead epidermis at the top is that, as we saw in the previous image, let's go back to that here, the blood vessels supplying oxygen and nutrients come up to the bottom layer of the epidermis but don't actually enter it. This means that those bottom couple layers of cells get oxygen and nutrients by diffusion. But if you get more than a couple cell layers away from that blood supply, you don't have oxygen, you don't have food, and you die. So that bottom layer is constantly dividing and replacing, and approximately once a month your entire epidermis is replaced. So that's a, a lot of cell division for that living lower layer to carry on. But it does that. Because, though, that is a high rate of cell division, that means that skin cancer is quite common, because the more quickly mitosis occurs, the more likely you are to have mutations and then result in cancer. So skin cancer, as we'll talk about here in a few minutes, is a relatively common thing. But as long as you catch it early in the process, it is also very treatable. So let's think about the papillary layer and what it does to the epidermis. If we look here is a really beautiful picture of a fingerprint. So this is the tip of a finger and you see here friction ridges. And so friction ridges are what give you your fingerprint. And you can see that they're covered with openings of sweat gland ducts. So the sweat glands that were in the skin are going to release sweat onto the surface of the skin, or think of it as oil. And that oil is going to coat the friction ridges. Then if you touch something relatively lightly to moderately lightly, the friction ridges touch it, but the grooves between them don't which means the oil that was on the friction ridges contacts whatever you touched and is left behind with little spaces between the oil markings where the grooves between the friction ridges occurred. So this then leaves oil behind on whatever you touch in the pattern of your friction ridges. And so every single person on the planet has a slightly different friction ridge pattern on their fingers, meaning that fingerprints are unique to you. So if your fingerprints are found somewhere, that means you actually touched those things. So from a forensics and criminal investigation standpoint, friction ridges are very significant. We can also have cleavage lines that we would find a little bit deeper in the dermis, 
And those are also going to be differences in consistency and arrangement of the dermis, which then gives some epidermal significance. Cleavage lines really are there to allow for more effective movement in the direction that you're most often going to need to move. So if we start with the hand, the hands are going to move in all sorts of different directions. And if we look at the cleavage lines there, we can see that there are cleavage lines running in pretty much every direction you can imagine. These are the sorts of things that allow the tissue to more efficiently fold back and forth or open and close its folds as your body bends. So the abdominal region can have some forward and back flexure. It can have some left and right twisting. So what you see are cleavage lines there in the abdominal region that allow for all of those movements. Up at the pectoral region in the chest we see multiple different directions of cleavage lines there because we have multiple different directions of movement. But across the rib cage for the most part, we just see horizontal cleavage lines because the ribs are not necessarily going to allow a great deal of flexure or movement in any direction other than a front to back sort of arrangement. So whatever direction the tissues, the skin is going to be pulled on a regular basis or folded on a regular basis, that's the direction you're going to have cleavage lines. And this is the sort of thing that the more you use it, the deeper those cleavage lines become. And we'll also see that present in our next feature, flexure lines. Flexure lines are things you would find mostly in the hands and feet. And the significance here is this is also where folding of the tissues occur. So if you see those flexure lines on the fingers there, they occur where the finger actually bends, so at a joint. Then the flexure lines on the palm of the hand are where the tissues of the hand the palm of the hand itself are going to fold. So if you look at your hand fully extended, so the fingers are all the way with a fully open hand, you'll see those lines present. Then watch those lines as you slowly start to make a fist. And where those lines are is where the tissue starts to fold up and roll up on itself, allowing the hand, in this case, to move and to fold up without those tissues being as much in the way. As you might imagine, the more you use this, the deeper the grooves would get. So if you looked at the flexure lines on the hand of a newborn baby, for example, you would expect to see very, very faint lines there, so nothing really significant. But if you look at the hands of a much older person, let's say 70 or 80 years old, you would expect to see very deep and heavily grooved flexure lines because it's been used more, it's been folded back and forth more, and that creasing has become more significant and more permanent. So really all those things were there as a result of the, derma, of the dermis and its texture and its arrangement and how that affected the epidermis and its expression. If we go back just briefly to this idea of cleavage lines, if you were to have surgery and the surgeon slices into you, if they slice alongside these cleavage lines, where the tissue was normally going to fold back and forth in somewhat of a marking anyway, the resulting sewing you back up and repair process will result in a quicker recovery and probably a less noticeable recovery because those were already areas where your body was flexing anyway. And if you just quote unquote follow the dotted lines, you get a cleaner outcome. So that's something that surgeons will try to take advantage of if they can, making incisions that follow the lines that are already there so they're not as big a deal on the back side. Here's an example of some dermal markings that are not necessarily so useful, certainly not useful, and probably not really desirable either. These are called stretch marks. And so what we're looking at here is the abdominal region of an individual. And this is probably a female, probably post-pregnancy. And the reason I'm saying that is that these stretch marks seem to be in a somewhat circular fashion, orbiting the uh, umbilical location, the, the belly button. And so this probably was a result of pregnancy. But stretch marks really indicate tearing in the skin and in the subdermal tissues because of excessive and rapid 
pressure and stretching. Hence the name stretch marks. So what you're seeing here as these uh, light to medium purple markings are actually scars. That's visible scars that have torn the skin to the extent, and not the external skin, remember, just the, uh, the deeper portions of the skin and the underlying tissues, has torn to the point where the scar tissue that's produced to tie it back together is significant enough that you see it. And this is probably along the lines of the more significant of stretch marks. You can have stretch marks that are relatively small and not very many, all the way up to this perhaps being one of the more worst case scenario sort of settings. And um, again, probably in this case was because of pregnancy. So in nine months you go from whatever you were to you plus baby plus 50% more blood and so that results in significant and typically quite rapid, especially in the last trimester, enlargement of the abdominal cavity. So extreme rapid stretching and the tissue has a hard time accommodating that. Unfortunately, this is a permanent condition. There's not really any good solution for it. Over time, the scars will shrink a little, so they will get smaller in appearance. And they will also become paler, so they'll get lighter in color as you go, becoming a little bit less obvious. But in this particular case, it's always going to be very noticeable scar masses. If it was only a couple of scars, you could have a plastic surgeon go in and slice them out and perhaps delicately put the skin back together and hope that it produces a better solution. But this is enough scarring that if that were the approach, that surgeon would be spending years going in here and taking out a few at a time, putting it back together and letting it heal and hoping that things work well. So really, prevention is a better solution than fixing afterwards. So what do we do to prevent? If you happen to be pregnant, and let's say it's in the early stages, what you can do is you can use uh, any number of lotions and creams. Uh, one brand calls itself belly butter. And what it's designed to do is to moisturize the skin. And what we do know is that a moisturized, well-hydrated skin is much more elastic than in a drier, less hydrated skin. So the more of that lotioning you do, perhaps the less significant the stretch marks might actually turn out to be. Probably with pregnancy, I would expect there to be a couple of stretch marks in the best case scenario. And if you uh, use these products, it will help. It's not guaranteed to avoid stretch marks completely, but certainly the more hydrated and moist the skin is, the more it's going to be able to handle that kind of stretching. I suppose an even better solution from the preventative perspective is don't become pregnant at all. For several of you, perhaps it's a little bit late for that, but I would propose it is certainly an honorable choice if you decide you do not want to have children. This might just be the icing on the cake for making that decision, but if that's what you decide, I certainly would respect that. This sort of outcome can also occur just by being overweight. So the more overweight a person would become, the more likely you would be to see this. And again, the abdominal region is going to be the most common area where you would see it. You might also see it in the uh, upper thighs and in the upper arms, uh, probably and perhaps in, in breast tissue. If, if there's a significant amount of breast tissue, and especially then with breastfeeding, might result in some stretching there or something like that. So being overweight, having a lot of pressure on the tissue, uh, being pregnant, those sorts of things are really what's going to cause this outcome. What you see here is a baby who looks very unhappy. And really all babies are unhappy little critters for the most part. At least mine were. But what we're seeing here is we're seeing the presence of seborrhea or cradle cap in a baby. So the oil glands of the skin have been producing oil for some time now at the, once this baby is born, but it's not been being washed off. So if oily substances are produced but not washed off, because there's no scrubbing going on in the uterus, then it kind of cakes up and builds up. So what you see here is just a buildup of a lot of oils produced by the skin. With gentle scrubbing, and I'm not saying pulling out a wire scrub brush, 
I'm saying at first using a washcloth and just gently wiping the baby's head. And then as the baby gets a little older, you can uh, scrub it a little harder, and that stuff will start to flake off over time and clean up. And probably by the time the baby is a year old or so, most of that stuff with proper cleaning will have been scrubbed up and kept from accumulating farther. But certainly when they're first born, they can be extra ugly. I would propose that all babies are born ugly, and most of them recover quickly afterwards. But with this uh, buildup of oil and stuff, it's going to be a more ugly baby at first. And that's one of the reasons why they're going to slap that little sock hat on the baby's head before they bring it back and hand it to mama if possible, so that mama doesn't see this scaly, alien-headed little creature that she just gave birth to. That would certainly add to the anxiety and stress of that situation to see how ugly the thing is when it comes out. And I say that with the best of intentions, because both of my children were born exceedingly ugly and fortunately resolved that situation fairly quickly, but being born does not improve a baby's appearance. The good news is, in a couple of weeks, they typically recover nicely. Let's talk about the scary part of skin and skin problems. And this is something I'm more of an expert on than I would like to be, because my skin is a rapidly mutating skin. My skin likes to, for no obvious reason, form abnormal masses. And so once a year, I have to go into the dermatologist for a full head-to-toe exam to make sure that my body has not mutated farther in the direction of cancer. So we have three different kinds of skin cancer we see here. The first one is basal cell carcinoma. Then we have the squamous cell carcinoma and then melanoma as the third example. If you were to look at basal cell carcinoma, it probably wouldn't look like something that you had envisioned cancer would look like. Then if you look at the squamous cell carcinoma, you would say that looks like a problem, but it could just be a sore. It could be a scrape on the skin, something like that. It doesn't necessarily look like what you had envisioned cancer looking like. But then we get to melanoma, and now you start saying, yes, that looks like cancer. So the physical appearance does have something to do with it and this is how the doctor is going to diagnose it. So all three of these are diagnosed actual cancers even though the first two might not look like it. So what we have is the ABCDE rule and what this does is it looks at five different criteria about the appearance of that skin spot to determine if it's likely to be cancerous or a problem. So the A stands for asymmetry. So when we're talking about asymmetry, we're talking about uh, the appearance here from the perspective of uh, is it a balanced spot? Does it have nice uh, even surface? Or is it unbalanced? Is it higher on one side, lower on the other? Does it have uh, uneven texture and shape within it? And so when we look at this basal cell carcinoma, it's got a little bit of an indention in the middle. So it, it checks the A concern box a little bit, but uh, not necessarily a real big check mark there. If we look at squamous cell carcinoma, it certainly checks the A box for asymmetry. It's not consistently uniform throughout the spot. And then melanoma, obviously we've got lumps, we've got bumps, we've got depressions in there, so that one checks A as well. B stands for border irregularity. Does the edge of this spot have nice, smooth, round edges with a clear starting and stopping place? We would like to see everything be nice and smooth, uniform, and have a nice clean cutoff between the concerning area in the rest of the skin. So in the basal cell carcinoma here, it looks like it has a relatively round, smooth, relatively defined border. So it doesn't check the B box very significantly. The squamous cell carcinoma is kind of coming in and out. It's, it's not really perfectly round. It's not got perfectly clean edges. It's got some squiggly edges, so it's checking the B box reasonably. And then melanoma, it's curving, it's swerving, 
Uh, it's um, definitely checking the box. Now keep in mind these are just textbook examples. Each individual form of this cancer might not look exactly the same, but we're just looking for these criteria. Are these criteria present? And then the doctor can do some further examinations to determine exactly which of these problems it might be. C stands for color. So we're going to look at the color of this spot and say, does it match the rest of the skin or is it abnormally pigmented? So for the basal cell carcinoma, it looks pretty well pigmented the way the rest of the skin does. Not a significant color difference there. So it doesn't really check the C box very well. The squamous cell carcinoma is pinker than the rest of the skin and it has dark spots scattered throughout. So irregularity of coloration is also a concern. So if it's darker in some spots, lighter in other spots, that's just as concerning as being uniformly off-colored. The melanoma there clearly has significant coloration differences between itself and the surrounding tissues. So a nice big check mark there for melanoma. Diameter. We would say that the size of a pencil eraser is our criteria for acceptable size. So if it's smaller than a pencil eraser, size isn't a concern really. If it's bigger than a pencil eraser, the thought is the size is getting bigger. And the reason why we worry about both color and size is that the bigger around it gets and the darker it gets, that suggests that it's growing deeper as well. And deeper means more likely to metastasize, to spread from that one spot having a localized cancer and potentially become a body-wide form of cancer depending on where it lands. So you never want metastasis to occur. You don't want it to spread. I personally like to add in an E. And E adds some more criteria, some more information to consider. And E stands for elevation. And this means how high is it protruding above the level of the rest of the skin. This is another one of those things that the higher up it sticks, that suggests perhaps it's growing deeper as well. And again, deeper is never good. We can then take an E and apply to everything. So if any of these letters are evolving or changing significantly, that's a concern as well. We don't want to see change. Change means it's not really growing, uh, or rather change means that it is growing. No change means that it's probably not growing. So really what the dermatologist is doing every year is checking for new spots of abnormality and examining all the spots that were already there to see if they have evolved or not. To see if they've gotten bigger, or if they've gotten darker, or if they've gotten more irregular. And if that's happening, then the doctor will say, we should take that off. Over the years, I've lost count of how many different parts of my skin have been chopped off, or frozen off, or burned off, with the thought that this is changing in a direction we're not comfortable with, it matches these criteria too significantly, let's remove it. So let's say you've gone to the doctor, and they have noticed something on you that they've looked at these criteria and decide it's concerning. Just because you match one of the criteria doesn't necessarily mean cancer, but the more of the criteria you match, the more likely that it is. So if the doctor decides this is a concerning spot on your skin, they might choose to do a biopsy. And a biopsy involves, uh, it can be either a punch biopsy or a scrape biopsy, but either way, they're taking a section of that tissue and they're going to look at it under a microscope. When you look at those cells under a microscope, you can see exactly what they're doing and what kind of mutation is going on there. And then they can determine, should we go in aggressively and take out all of this? Or is it something that maybe looked worse than it really is? And so the results of that biopsy would then determine further action. If it's something that they're going to freeze off, they'll probably just freeze it off and not bother with a biopsy at all unless they thought it was something really bad, because the freezing process hopefully gets all of that problematic tissue all at once. And I've had every possible treatment for this you can imagine. I've had things cut off, frozen off, burned off. And in my case, every single one of them leaves significant amounts of scar tissue behind. 
And I think I talked about this in chapter 4 with tissue repair. My body makes lots of scar tissue, so every place the doctor has ever touched me with a scalpel or with a burning device, uh, I have a visible scar left to show for it. And one of the last ones I had done actually left scars for each of the stitches. So I can go back now and tell you that that particular incision took about eight stitches to sew up. And uh, I know that because I can count eight stitch scars. So the stitch material itself left scars along with the scar of the original incision. Beautiful stuff. So this is something that you should take very seriously. And as long as you catch it while it is only skin cancer and it hasn't spread anywhere else in the body, it's curable, completely curable. You just take it off. And if it hadn't gone anywhere else, then it's gone. If they have concerns that it might have gone somewhere else, they can check lymph nodes. And you might go as far as to engage in chemotherapy or some things like that to try to catch any little pieces that they might have missed along the way. I have never had that level of problem that they needed to do anything more than surgical removal, but I know of people who have, and it can be a multi-month process, trying to make sure they get all of it, because even one cancerous cell that is missed can regrow the entire mass. So skin cancer, kind of a big deal. Burns are also a problem. So if you burn yourself, it doesn't matter whether it was on a hot stove or a chemical burn or an electrical burn, a burn is a burn. And basically that's damaged skin. And the question is, how bad is this? You've heard of first, second, and third degree burns before. So let's just take a quick look at those, then we'll come back to this rule of nines business. The picture A here has both first and second degree burns there. So if we look at the fingertips, they have first degree burns. And that's typically characterized by reddening of the skin. So if the epidermis is damaged, that's a first degree burn. This can be something like touching a hot stove, or the standard sunburn is typically a first degree burn, or reddening of the skin in any form like that is a first degree burn. Sometimes a wind burn, being in too much wind, can cause a slight degree of burning on the skin as well. You wouldn't think of wind doing that, but it certainly can. So first degree burns typically are inconvenient. They may be somewhat sensitive or painful, but typically self-healing within a week or two. A second degree burn, like you would see here towards the palm of the hand. So this person probably touched something hot first with their palm, then with their fingers. Managed to get their fingers off first, then their palm off last. So what you see in the second degree burn is blistering. So this means that you have the epidermis is mostly destroyed, and the dermis underneath is significantly damaged. This is very readily displayed in the form of blisters that are there almost automatically and they're going to fill up with fluid and a second degree burn is probably going to hurt worse than a first degree burn did because you significantly damage the nerves there but not to the point of total destruction so they're very irritated and sensitized second degree burns obviously will take a lot longer to heal so we're not looking at just a week on that and the risk to your overall health goes up because now a second degree burn blister is likely to pop. And if it pops, we have just lost integrity of the skin. Remember we said skin's primary job was to keep stuff out. And if it is compromised when the blister pops, now the skin is no longer keeping things out at that point. So infection becomes more of a concern. And more burn victims die of resulting infections that come from the compromised skin status than they do from the actual burn itself. A third degree burn is when the epidermis is gone, the dermis is gone, and the hypodermis is significantly damaged. So in picture B we see that full thickness or third degree burn. You can see the edges there where the skin was and it peeled back and what you're seeing is almost to the layer of muscle underneath that. It looks a lot worse than the first and second degree burns did, and for good reason. It is much worse. You have absolutely no protection from the external environment in that spot. So now the question is, what is truly life-threatening? So a critical burn 
is a burn that is either life-threatening or life-altering. And we determine degrees of severity, obviously, with the first, second, third degree classification, but also with this idea of critical burns. So a critical burn, so a life-changing or life-threatening burn, could either be 25% or more of the body covered in second degree burns, 10% or more of the body covered in third degree burns, or any third degree burns on the face, hands, and feet. So let's take those one at a time. 25% or more of the body covered in second degree burns, so covered in blisters. If a fourth or more of the body is covered in blisters, that means a fourth or more of the body is very likely to have significant compromise of the skin. How easy is it to have a lot of blisters and not pop them? It's not very easy at all. So infection becomes quite likely. So that becomes a life-threatening scenario and potentially a life-changing one from the scar tissue that would result from that. The 10% or more third degree burn, obviously you've lost all of the skin on 10% or more of the body, so that's again significant opening for infection and things like that, so life threatening and certainly life changing, you'll have a lot of scar tissue that results from that as well. So where it happens to occur would make the difference in how life changing it might be. Any third degree burn on the hands, feet, and face is now our question. If you have a third degree burn, even a small one on the face, think about what could have caused that. Did you accidentally lay your face on a hot stove? Probably not. So some sort of significant burning agent touched your face. And let's just say the most likely cause for that might be flame. But what do you instinctively do when something comes towards your face? You engage in a number of responses, but one of those is to take a deep sucking breath as a, oh my goodness, what's about to happen to me kind of response. And in the process, you may have just sucked whatever that burning agent was down the trachea into the lungs. So now we have the potential for respiratory system burns as well. If we get minor burns in the respiratory system, we'll have inflammation and swelling. We'll have respiratory distress. If we have significant burning in the respiratory system, we'll have enough swelling that it causes the trachea to swell shut, or it might completely melt the lungs. So in that case, you are at immediate uh, respiratory, not just distress, but lack of respiratory airflow, and that is quite likely to be a fatal condition. So any third degree burn on the face becomes labeled as a critical burn because it means there's a significant likelihood that the respiratory system has been somewhat burned as well. So that certainly needs an immediate in-depth examination to see if that has occurred or not. If it has, then they'll obviously try to do whatever they can for it, but the respiratory system is not really designed to withstand a lot of heat, so it is very easily damaged. If you had third degree burns on the hands, would that mean that you had a life-threatening scenario? Probably not. Obviously, any possible infection that comes along could be life-threatening, but we're more concerned here with life-changing or life-altering. Think about all the different things your hands can do, all the different directions they can move. And if you have a large amount of scar tissue that accumulates because of this serious burn, would you perhaps lose some of the mobility and functionality of the hands? That certainly would be life-changing. You might find it difficult and clumsy to use your fingers if they happen to be in the fingers close to joints. So it could be very much life-changing. The same sort of thing with the feet. You're probably not going to die from a, a relatively small burn on the feet, even if it's third degree. But you would lose perhaps some degree of functionality of the feet. And the feet can do a lot of things not as impressive of an array of functions as the hands, but still they do a great deal of moving that you don't really realize until you don't have it. So a burn there with accumulating scar tissue is probably more likely to be a life-changing scenario. Now another question piles up here. We're talking about this 25%, this 10%, 
how do we assess how much of the body was actually affected here? And so here's where this rule of nines comes in. And what we've done is we've taken the body and broken it into chunks of 9% as best as we can. So the front of the legs would be 9%. The back of a leg, or, or sorry, of each leg would be 9%. The back of each leg would be 9%. The front of the trunk, so the from the neck to the hips, is 18%. So half of that would be 9. An arm would be 9. The other arm would be 9. The head and neck would be 9. And so you can use those sort of rough designations of percentages to do a quick and dirty calculation for how much of the body is affected here. So if we're talking about 10% of the body with third degree burns would be our critical designation. And our person has experienced to third degree burns on the knee and lower leg. Would that person be classified as having a critical burn? If the front of the leg is 9% and only half of the front of the leg has been affected here, we're only at 4.5% of the total surface area, so while it is significant, it doesn't get classified as critical. You would feel that it was critical, but from a medical perspective, would not get that official classification. If we had the entire leg and any part of the front of the trunk, or I guess we could have the side of the trunk there as well, anything on the trunk plus all of or the front of one leg, or if we had all of one leg by itself, we certainly would be past our 10% third degree burn there. So at that point, it would become classified as critical. If we had the anterior trunk and the front of both arms, would that be a critical burn? And let's say that was second degree. So anterior trunk plus front of both arms, second degree burns, is that critical? The answer is yes. That's over 25% covered in second degree burns, so critical there. But if you had the entire body covered in first degree burns, that would not be classified as critical because no part of critical involves first degree burns. Now it's an interesting concept that a first degree burn can be sensitive and, and somewhat painful perhaps, Second degree burns certainly would burn and hurt like a few other things you've ever experienced before. But it often occurs that third degree burns have no pain or sensation associated with them. And it is possible that a person could experience a third degree burn and not be aware that they had a burn at all. Because what happens is it burns so deeply into the skin that it destroys the nerves that were telling you something's happening in the skin. So the receptors in the skin for pain and issues like that are damaged to the point where they don't tell you anything, it doesn't hurt. You are probably going to have second degree burns around the edges of the third degree burn, and those might very much hurt. But again, the third degree burn itself probably doesn't hurt. Now we need to think about how do we treat a burn. So grandma probably had a solution for treating a burn. And it probably involves something like butter or Crisco or something like that. And they would say, cover it with this and it will make it better. And the solution, well, that really wasn't a good outcome. It probably helped with the pain, but it did not help with the actual problem. So regardless whether there's a first, second, or third degree burn present, you need to ask yourself the following questions. What degree of burn is it? Is the skin already compromised? If the answer is yes, you need to be a little bit more careful with this scenario. But the first thing that you want to do is you want to cool it off as quickly as possible to stop the burning from going farther. So a safe solution here might be just some cold tap water. I wouldn't suggest ice because ice can cause freezing of the skin and that would then further compound your situation but some cool water will help to cool it off and stop additional damage. Second thing that you want to do is you want to get some sort of covering over it to make sure that we keep it as clean and sterile as possible 
but also something that is not going to stick to the wound. So a non-sticky or non-adhering, cool, clean object. A first degree burn really doesn't need that sort of thing, but second and third becomes more of an issue. So a clean, well, this is a little bit difficult. We want something that's not going to stick. But a clean, wet rag perhaps is a starting place there. But you don't want something that's going to trap additional heat in there and make it worse. So a cooling but covering to keep it as clean as possible. And if it's a third degree burn, I would suggest going to the hospital immediately for treatment. They will look at it and provide whatever additional assistance they deem is necessary at that point. But here's why you never want to use the butter, the Crisco, that sort of thing on a wound like this, on a burn wound. Besides the fact that it traps heat in there and long term makes it worse, if you go to the hospital, they're going to have to clean that out. And so they're going to get a scrub brush and they're going to scrub that off. And it's going to hurt much worse than the original burn did. And they don't care what it feels like. They're going to scrub that off. So don't put stuff on there that they'll just have to scrub back off because that makes it hurt worse. There, They'll clean out the damaged tissue and make sure it's as clean as possible. And then they'll look at things they can do to help it heal. And along the way, try to keep it clean. If you have significant burns across a significant percentage of the body, they might put you in a basically a plastic tent that is trying to isolate you from your environment as much as possible. And the more isolated you are from the environment, the cleaner you will stay, and the less likely you'll develop an infection. So significant burn victims end up spending a lot of time in those little plastic tents and certainly it would make it better, but it's really, really hard to completely sterilize someone and keep them completely sterile for these kinds of wounds to heal. So infections are often a significant problem in the later steps of dealing with a burn. And again, most of the time, burn victims that die, die from the infection, probably not as many from the actual burn itself. If there is skin that is significantly damaged in the third degree fashion, then you might look at things like a skin graft, basically taking a piece of healthy skin from somewhere else, hopefully on the same person's body, and just putting it in place there as a, a patch that will hopefully take and be a functional new skin. But often that involves a great deal of scar tissue left behind. So they've come up with some more things in recent... Uh, years that are assistances in regrowing skin and the unit 2 discussion board required post question probably will deal with different ways skin can be repaired whether it's by skin graft or by a synthetic skin or by using fish skin as a temporary skeleton or perhaps by the idea of spray on skin and I personally really like the idea of spray on skin Basically, you grow your skin in a bottle of solution and then use a squirt bottle or a spray can to spray it onto the damaged area and basically reseeding that part of the body with healthy skin cells. The possibilities with that are quite significant, I believe, so we'll see what you come up with in your discussion board research. That wraps up the lecture part of Chapter 5. Make sure that you do the reading assignment for this. And also, there will be a couple of other videos here posted dealing with skin cancer and that sort of thing. So check those out. I think you'll find them very interesting and sometimes entertaining. And hopefully you learned a lot here. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you next time.